first of all, thanks, thanks for hanging out. This is the last session of the conference, so thank you for uh, spending the next hour with me. And just curious, how many of you are using Spark at work? Okay, so just maybe like a fifth or so. How many of you have never heard of Spark? So I guess I, for, so for this session, uh, this is divided into two parts. The first part, we're gonna go give you a quick high level introduction to Spark in about 20, 25 minutes-ish. And then the second part, we'll use Spark to analyze the San Francisco inspection data so you can kind of see how Spark uh, works and stuff like that uh, in action. Yeah, it will be online later. Um, but before I start, I just wanted to do a quick poll when we go into the, uh, the analyzing part. I assume some of you is, uh, have gone up to San Francisco and dying up there once in a while, I assume. How many of you think San Francisco restaurants are clean? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> Notice kind of a vague question. Right? What does it mean clean? <laughs> you probably don't want to see the back. <laughs> so, okay, so it sounds like most of you said uh, San Francisco are not clean. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that changes once we finish looking at the data. All right, so just a little bit about me. I'm currently at LinkedIn uh, doing software, software there. I was at Uber a little while, and then I was Netflix. Uh, on my part-time, I teach my passion, teaching at UCSC Extensions. Uh, this, is, I, uh, this is my second time presenting something at Silicon Valley. I also present at other conferences, including QCon and stuff and whatnot. And feel free to ask questions along the way, okay? All right, what is Spark? At a very high level, it's considered as the unified engine for data applications. So anytime you, have, you do any kind of data processing, uh, ETLs or building uh, application for generating insights, data analysis, BA, data scientists, data engineers, um, then the Spark is, is very nice for that. And it's the, the greatest thing is this unify, meaning that it can support different kinds of workloads that you would typically do in doing data processing. Uh, we all know batch processing, that's what MapReduce was invented for, and it's, it's awesome at that. But it's not very strong in other kinds of data processing, including stream processing, uh, machine learning, and stuff like that. Uh, so Spark is awesome at providing this one unified engine to allow you to do all this. That means that less cost in terms of operating and managing the cluster. Right? Instead of managing five different kinds of technologies, then you just manage one. And it's very, very flexible in terms of working with different kinds of data sources from unstructured to structured data, as well as uh, talking to external system, including Cassandra, Cassandra, MySQL, HBase, and all the other open sources, Elasticsearch and stuff like that. And then, just so you know, it's being widely adopted out there by the industry. It's being adopted, adopted one by you know, the big names out there, Facebook, Netflix, uh, all the big, including LinkedIn. So you know it's fairly mature, and it's, it's constantly, they're constantly uh, innovating to improve the, the core and also the usability of this, and we're gonna talk about some of that. So in terms of adoption, there's not really a risk anymore that you go and, and introduce this to your company and whatnot. You can use for small data or big data, and something like that. Uh, recently, Facebook started migrating from Hive, which is what they've been using for a long, long time, for a very large scale, um, you know, doing machine learning models or doing uh, generate tons and tons of engram, bigram, and all that good stuff. And they start moving off Hive into Spark because just the sheer volume of what they have, and it takes longer and longer, and they find that Spark giving them at least 2x, 3x, in some cases 6x faster than Hive. And they've been contributing uh, a lot of those bugs that they found back to the community, so it's pretty awesome to see. So to give you a high level how Spark works, 
in terms of a very, very high level, um, it's considered a master slave architecture, meaning there's this master and there's a bunch of slaves. The master tells the slaves what to do. Slaves are dumb, right? Uh, so in the landscape of Spark, there's this notion called a driver. And we'll, we'll see that in more detail in, in, a, in a second. And the driver is, is orchestrating what your application is supposed to do, the, the right sequences and stuff like that. And it tells the, the, the slave, the executor in this case, what to do. Slave is take instruction from the master, execute that, and we turn the data back to the driver. And this is considered slots. Slots meaning uh, the cores on your, on your nodes, on the uh, cluster, on the machines in the cluster. So a little more detail in terms of the execution. If you, act, if you submit a Spark job, how does that work? How is this different than MapReduce world? So each Spark application, this, the, the box on, the, on your left-hand side are the drivers, the masters. And the, the, the box on the right-hand side are nodes. Uh, so within each node, it's considered like a machine. Okay? And on a node, you can have this executor, which is basically a process, nothing more. It's a JVM process. Each node can have, can host more than one executors, of course. Um, the key thing to note is the executors, you see the caller, are dedicated to a specific application, right? And it stays up for the entire lifetime of that Spark application, okay? So executors are not shared across applications for isolation purposes but it stays up for the entire lifetime of the application. If the application runs for six hours, the executor stays up for six hours. And all the tasks that need to be done are sent from the, the master to the Spark application to the executor to execute. So this is one very, very big difference in terms of architecture comparing this to MapReduce, right? If you're familiar with MapReduce in the world of map, mapper reducers, each of those tasks will have to spawn a brand new JVM. Okay, so this is very different from that. Yeah. Partially. Uh, yeah, so the other thing that I was going to bring up is in the executor, there's this thing called the green box that you see. It's, it's a cache. So Spark, when Spark started out, one of the distinguished features from MapReduce is the in-memory computation capability, right? Which MapReduce not able to do, uh, any other system were able to do, but Spark was, that's, that's one of the innovations out of Spark. Um, so you can take the data set, you filter it down to a little more smaller data set that can fit into this memory uh, of your cluster, and then you now, your data is in the cluster, in memory rather, is very, very fast. And that's why you see uh, numbers out there where Spark is 100x faster than MapReduce because of that. So for each executor, this is a notion of this cache per executor. And each executor has they call tasks or slots. So if an executor has, when you allocate executors, you say how much memory each executor should have and how, much, how many cores it should have. Uh, and each core corresponds to able to execute per task per core. And that's basically uh, your parallelism of your, of your uh, application. So that's, so that's at a very high level how Spark works in the terms of the execution. Most of this is behind the scene for you, but it's good to have kind of a mental picture how, how it works at high level. So moving on to the programming model, right? We just talked about how the execution model. Programming model is something that we as developers need to be uh, aware of and how to use and how it works. The Spark started out with this concept, very main concept in Spark is called resilient distributed data sets. It's a very fancy term. It's nice to throw that around in a cocktail party. Uh, <laughs> but what does that mean, right? <laughs> Uh, it's effectively an abstraction model, abstraction model for us to, as developer, how to use to manipulate, how to, you know, how to do processing. Uh, but conceptually, it's just an, an object that represents this gigantic data set that you have. Let's say you have a 100 terabytes file in your cluster. 
Um, when you want to process the data, you want to look for certain things in your, in your file. You don't really care how big that is. You just care about, here's my object and here's my API, and I can just call API to do what I need to do. Right? I want to filter, uh, look for certain exceptions and whatnot. Um, but behind the scene, as far as Spark goes, is when you copy a, a 100 terabytes files onto Hadoop or whatever, it's, it's, it breaks it down into smaller chunks. Right? And it parallels, it, it processes each of those chunks in parallel. So that's how you're able to process 100 terabytes in you know, 30 seconds versus hours if you do that on a single node and whatnot. Uh, so there's, there's partitions. Each of those maintains a partition or block of your data, effectively. Another key thing is RAD is resilient. So, you know, in a distributed system, if a node went down, you don't want to restart the job from the beginning. If it was been running for six hours, that wouldn't be good. So it's resi resilient against that kind of thing. And it's immutable, meaning that once you create it, you cannot change it in a way that we think that it can be changed, but you can do transformations and whatnot, and that would return you a new RAD. And that's the next step is how you uh, manipulate the RAD. Um, the RAD has two types of APIs. They're called transformations and actions. This is a subset of transformations and actions. So what's the difference? The difference is transformations are lazy evaluated, meaning that when you call that API, it doesn't do at that very moment what you want to do. Let's say you want to do uh, you have a data set you want to compute a distinct. It's not going to do that the moment that you call that API at all. Right? Uh, or you want to do filter, for example. It won't do that. It will take note of that, but it won't execute that against your 100 terabyte file. It will only execute those logic when you take an action. Right? So you want to do a count, or you want to save the output somewhere, then it's going to backtrack of all the transformation that you call and then compute uh, auto logic, figure out auto logic that needs to execute. And, and only then they will execute those transactions. And why do you think they design, they design the transformation to be lazy? Optimization, Optimization right? So if, if I call five filters in a row, it's going to collapse into a single filter and execute that. So that's the kind of optimization that Spark does without us having to really think about it. So, so that's pretty cool. So optimization is the key. Is there any way to both have transactions? No. If your application contains only transactions, Spark will do absolutely nothing for your application. No, it's actually handled by the, uh, the processing of, of the APIs that you call. But, but all that stuff's being done by the master, yes. Right, exactly. So you only want to read the 100 gigabyte data once. Ideally, yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So here's a very simple example of RDD word count, uh, four or five lines. The first line reads in the text file. That could, be rep that could represent 100 terabytes of a text file, or as small as a megabyte te text file, doesn't matter. The second line does basically is take reading each line, split into words, and that's what you see looks, uh, that's what it looks like at the bottom. And then now for each of the words, we create tuples out of that so we can count. And finally, we group the words together and sum them up. And therefore, uh, you will have the output to be like that. So that's the word count example in RDD. Okay, very, very simple. Five lines of code in Scala. But now, RDD is considered old school. The abstraction model has been shifted, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. As we know, you know, in the world, is the, we have many kinds of data formats, right? From all the way from unstructured to structured. And the more structured data we have, the more the more the, the more information Spar has about our structured data the more it can be smart about doing any, you know, various types of, types of optimizations for us. And that's what, I'm, that's what um, Spark 2.0 uh, 
themes are. Make how, do, how does it make it easier for us, faster, and be smarter? So Spark.1, you know, it was awesome. It came out. It proves it's working. Uh, it proves they can do all this awesome stuff. And then the, the thing that I really like about Databricks guys is they're really uh, pushing the envelopes, uh, coming up with all kinds of new innovations and stuff like that. So right now, Spark is at 2.x version. So how does it make it easier, faster, and smarter? Uh, there's this they call unifying data sets and data frame. That's a newer abstraction uh, than RDD. RDD is an old school. Now when we use Spark, we don't, 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't use RDD anymore. You're gonna start using data frame and data sets. Faster, uh, there's kinds of uh, interesting stuff projects called tungstens and stuff like that. I'll mention that in a second. And then smarter, uh, starting 2.x, Spark has um, in, well, kind of redesigned their streaming engine effectively. In 1.x, they have a streaming engine, but it's not really efficient, and it doesn't have the other features compared to the other streaming engine. I'll talk about that as well. So, the data frame layer sits in the component called Spark SQL, uh, the data frame, data frame API. And underneath that, there's a cat catalyst optimizer. I'll go into that in a second. Uh, effectively, now you can write applications using Spark APIs as well as uh, an application that can talk to JDBC, that can talk to Spark, because Spark support that kind of protocol. And underneath the Spark core, um, yes, you can see RD is still there. That doesn't mean RDD is going away, by the way. It's, it's still there. It's just like sam assembly code does not go away. It's still there, right? So let's go into more details. As I mentioned before, the programming model is being shifted from 1.x to 2.x, um, from unstructured data to semi-structured data. And the cool thing is with the data frame, Spark can do a a slew of optimization that it couldn't do before because it now it, it knows about the structure of our data. In terms of APIs, it's somewhat similar, but the coolest thing is now we can, with Spark um, SQL component, instead of writing code, you can write SQL statements. And think about that for a second. What does that mean? What does that mean to the world of business analysts? What? They only know SQLs, and now they can use Spark to do data analysis. And that's why Spark's becoming so popular. Because of w one of the reasons why Spark's becoming so popular. Okay. Huh? That's right. And this is, this, take a look at that. The first line is how you use, we want to compute average age per department, right? That's if you have a data set and you want to compute the average age per department. The RDD ways is like, yeah, you can go through that. It will take you a few minutes to figure it out. The data frame, look at that, it's simpler, right? We look at SQL. I bet most of you can just read that line and say exactly what it's doing. Right? So we're going from RDD to SQL, and that's how, how, how much easier now to do data processing on Spark. All right, and not only is it easier, but um, Spark can do all kinds of crazy optimization for us by having this guy called Catalyst Optimizer that sits in between what we write and the code that it generates, right? So this, this is borrowed from the relational database uh, world, right? We write SQL and the whole optimizer figured out what to do What's the best plan to execute, the physical plan to execute? And that's exactly what the Catalyst Optimizer does. It takes your SQL statement or your code, whatever it is, uh, resolve it, translate it to logical plan. So it's basically a tree of operators. Yeah? I'll talk about that in a second. Yes. Um, and then it generates the optimized logical plan and translates that to physical plan. If you're coming from the database world, that's exactly very, very similar. It generates multiple physical plans and, and figure out what's the pl best plan to ex execute. Up until 2.1, the, the execution plans are mostly based on heuristics. Okay. 
But starting 2.2, it added a cost base. Before it was rule base, right? So it's smart, but uh, it's even smarter when it knows the, the distribution of your data and all the information about your data. And they added the cost base in 2.2. So when it knows about the statistics of your column, in terms of the cardinality, the min-max value, and all that good stuff, then it, it can be smart about figuring the right kind of joints based on the volume of data that you do in processing. Okay. So here's a, here's a good, good example of that. Uh, we have, we basically do a join, right? We select count star from T1, join T2, join an ID, where uh, T1 dot IH equal 30, so there's a filtering there. So T1, T2 is at the bottom, as you can see. T1, it's about uh, 5 billion rows of 500 gigabytes. T2 is about 100 million rows and 20 gigabytes. Uh, so 2.1, based on that information alone, it will select T2 as the smaller table and do a map size join based on that. But as you can see, once the filtering is done, it's way smaller. And now SWAT 2.0 understand your statistics of your data. It now is smarter to fit to uh, use the T1, the result T1 as the, the map side of the joint. So it's been way more efficient than before. All right. This is a lot more. Um, a lot under the cover stuff, but there's Project Tungsten. You can look it up for more information. Uh, a lot of people ask, like, why is Spark fast? There's many, many reasons why it's Spark fast. There's many, many things that it does to make it fast. One of them is with memory management. As we know, you know, uh, Spark is written Scala, right? So at the end of the day, it's bytecodes. Right? And it uses the JVM for memory management. And, and then if you do billions of rows data processing, you create lots and lots of objects. And the way, it, uh, the way it's trying to get away from that is to, to do its own memory management. And that's what Tungsten does, off-heap management capability to reduce um, the overhead of doing JVM. And the second thing is to do code generation. Phase two is, is what, uh, phase one was started in 2015. Phase two was complete in late 2016 with the optimization for the whole stage code chain. Uh, so let, let's talk about it a little bit. So imagine that, that we have this select statement, select cam star from store where item SK equal 1,000. The way it's designed in Spark with, with the whole you know, compile that down to a tree and all operators, right? Each does each operators. Each operator will have to go to each lines of code and at least lines of data to do filtering or, or counting, whatever. So there's a lot of virtual function calls going on, right? If you do that for like a small data set, nothing. Not, uh, it doesn't cost that much. But you're starting to do billions of rows, that adds up. So what do they do? They say, if we hire a college student to write that line of code, that's what probably most of us would write, right? And effectively, there's no operator. We just write in line. There's, there's very little virtual function calls going on there. So what's, what this means is Spark take that SQL code and generate code at runtime to be almost exactly like that. That's what I call whole stage, uh, whole stage code gen. So what they did was they did that, and then this is the result. Going from 14 million rolls per second to 125 million. So that's almost 9, 10x kind of speed. So that, that, um, so Spark is, has do many, many smart things to make it fast, not just one thing. So, um, so Spark is, has do many, many smart things to make it fast, not just one thing. So. All right, vectorization, that's another technique borrowed from uh, 
database row instead of processing one row at a time, it reading a bunch of row at a time, and then process over that. So it amortized the, the virtual function call over those batches. So that's another technique. So I make sure moving along here. All right, the last part I'm going to talk about is the structured streaming, which is the new streaming engine in Spark 2.0. Right in streaming application, it's, it's quite challenging because uh, versus your batch processing, it starts and then it ends, right? Uh, it fails, you restart, and nothing matters. The data is still there. Uh, streaming is a 24 by 7 application, uh, like online system. And the data keeps coming in and coming in. And then, so it's, just, it's more challenging in that regard. So structured streaming is a second generation streaming engine from Spark. To, this is what they claim. Uh, scalable it has to be there. Fault tolerant has to be there. The, uh, the cool thing is the end-to-end -end exactly once. That's the feature that's, um, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of companies are asking for when they start writing streaming application. Because when you stream, when you process data, what are you going to do with that data? Well, eventually you're going to write it out somewhere. Right? How does, how does most, most streaming system will will not do anything for you in that aspect. The developer will have to be responsible for that kind of part. But Spark is, is taking on that responsibility to make all lives easier. Yeah? How does this stream work? When they Kafka? Kafka is, yeah, Kafka is just a uh, publish subscribe system uh, that Spark can integrate with to read the, the data from. Kafka, he's asking about Kafka. Oh, Spark. Spark basically can integrate with Kafka to read the data from Kafka, right? Oh, yeah, Kafka is the published subscribe system. So with, with structured streaming, now, now you can build applications in addition to traditional use cases. You can do online machine learning model where you're feeding the new data to your machine learning and it, it trains it and whatnot in real time. So how does it work? Well, how, how does it make it easy for us? The way it wants us to think is, we know how to do batch processing. processing. It's just a table. Well, a stream of data is nothing more than a table with new rows being added to it. If we start thinking it that way, then it's become very simple. We just operate on that table, right? There's not, nothing else to think about it. You want to do a sum, you want to do aggregation, it's a table. So what does that mean to the code? The batch side is on the left-hand side, the stream is on the right-hand side. So we read the data, we select certain columns, and we write it out. This is a very simple, simple example. But the only thing difference is we're just adding the stream statement. Because of this, you can do this. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's nothing to think about, right? Spark takes care of all the, all the nitty-gritty behind the scene of knowing when the data comes in and incrementalize your, your, your query at the right time and, the right, and whatnot. And it's fault tolerance and everything. So there's a lot behind this, of course, but you can go read up more about it. But conceptually, that, that's what how easy it is to write streaming application nowadays. All right. Um, I want to get going so I can do the data analysis. Uh, so, and by the way, structured streaming is built on top of what, you, what we just talked about in the data frame. It's effectively a high-level API on top of data frames. So if you know AF data frames, it's very, it just is, it's more incremental on top of that. The new feature that it supported that was not in a previous uh, streaming engine is the event time. Before, we couldn't do this. We cannot do windowing on the event time, meaning that the time inside your event data. It has always been on processing time. So now you can do group by or windowing on the event time that's inside your data. So with end to end exactly once, for fault tolerance, it can write the, all the offset and for fault tolerance to a write ahead log. It does, also, another thing I didn't mention is in stream processing, you, 
most of the time you're going to do some kind of state management. Right? Store the state so you can do aggregations over the last 30 minutes, uh, top 10 customers visiting your sites and all that stuff. That's considered state management. And Spark makes it very, very easy to do that. So with that, the next, what time do we end? 3.45, right? All right, so I'm going to sw uh, switch over to do a little demo for everyone. If this thing comes back. So the demo is I'm using Databricks. Has anyone heard or used Databricks before? Oh, cool. OK. And you can all go get a free, uh, get a community edition account. It's totally free. But just in case you don't even know that. <laughs> free account, and you can launch a single node cluster with six gigs of RAM to play around with. So this is uh, the free account. So I'm going to analyze San Francisco restaurant inspection data to answer the question, uh, San Francisco restaurant clean. This data is available in Craigle that you can go and download. It's only about 12 megabytes, 12 megabytes and about 53,000 records. This is the schema in terms of columns. So it has the ID, name, address, city, state, long, uh, longitude, latitude, and whatnot. The thing that we are interested in are the Postal code, yite, you want to do that. And then the inspection score and risk category as well as violation description. All right, so just to show you that uh, this is live, this is using Spark 2.20. This is in Scala, by the way. I'm just executing the code, I wrote this before. So we do just define some variable, some import statement. Here I'm loading that files in, that files in CSV format. And it shouldn't take long. So all this is just, just kind of do a quick check to make, to make sure your data has the column and whatnot. And here's what I do account. This is an action, so it's actually gonna go through the file and find out how many records in that file. And it's gonna take, well, because I executed now, it's very, very fast. So there you go, about 53,000. Schema, it's exactly what I mentioned before. Now, before we do any kind of analysis, you want to clean your data, right? You want to only select the columns that you want, that you need, and clean the data. So what we're doing here is we drop the columns that we don't want. We drop all the rows that have any kind of null values in any columns. You might not do this. You might only do that for certain columns that have nulls. But in this case, I said drop everything any roles that have a no value in any columns. And then also because the data is kind of dirty, we want to make sure the zip code or the postal codes are valid postal code, five digits. And that's what's this can do. And the, all this is just transformation. As you can see, it doesn't do, it came back pretty quickly because nothing has happened. <laughs> uh, no, San Francisco have many zip codes, by the way. San Francisco City has many zip codes. So show is in actions. It's going to show you like 20 records in the data, in your data set. So there's ID, business name, postal code, zip code, and all that stuff. Once we do that, now the number of records drop, drop down to 27,000. Look at that. That's a lot of dirty data. <laughs> all right, let's do something fun. Let's see what the inspection in score distribution looks like. It's the score goes from zero to 100, right? 100 means good. So we only need three columns out of that, name, inspection score, and postal code. So to do distribution, we group by the inspection core, inspection, inspection score, and then we do count. And we order in descending order. So once we execute that and we displayed it, then this is what we get. Right? The majority of, the, of restaurants are on the high end over here. Right? This, the smaller number of restaurants have low score. But so let's kind of zoom in a little more. Let's, let's say what's the percentage the restaurant got greater than 80 score? 
Here's kind of all scatter. So let's have like a break it into two buckets, right? We're actually gonna have 80 score, uh, score 80 grade and 80 scores. So we break it into buckets right here. We say if inspection score greater than 80, give it a value one, else give it a value zero. And now we can kind of look at that data a little bit more clear. And what it's saying is 77% of restaurants have 80, will score 80 or better. So that's pretty good, right? And would you like to know which restaurants got the lowest scores? <laughs> Hopefully you didn't go there. <laughs> so there are some restaurants that got low scores. 46, 47, 47. Okay. And now let's see which one get high scores. So all we do is order by inspection score. That's how we're doing. So there's a restaurant with 100 scores. The inspections come with a risk category, right? To identify that is a high risk, low risk, and whatnot. So let's take a look at that. The distribution. So we have three categories, low, moderate, and high. And let's flip this to a pie chart. And as you can see, if you add up the moderate and high, that makes it about 50%-ish and 50% low risk. So that's saying that 50% of the violation is considered low risk in this inspection data. So it's kind of clean. <laughs> right. And now let's kind of drill further. Let's kind of zoom in and look at um, the average inspection score per zip code in San Francisco. Right. So we, we zoom in a little bit more. So all we do is just go by the zip code and do the average. You can see how easy it is to inspire to do this kind of thing, right? Yeah, you can you can write it in SQL. <laughs> Are you writing notebooks in the cloud? In the cloud. Somewhere in the cloud. So as you can see, I mean most zip codes have pretty good score on the average, right? Eighty or more. So that's not bad. Now this is look at more interesting part here. <laughs> so these are considered very serious violations. Do you agree? If restaurant get one violation, that's a, that's, that's a very big red flag for me. Uh, uh, what is this? A high risk vermin infestation, contaminated or adulterated food. Scary stuff, right? <laughs> so what we want to do is um, Figure out what's the proportion of restaurants in each of the zip codes that, that have, that have the one or more of these kind of violations. And you see what that looks like. Right? So all we do is just creating a, a list of the violations. We're creating a simple, easy to find function. Easy to find function is that simple to do. Um, so I'm just creating a very simple violation. Uh, is a serious violation UDF here. That way I can pass in uh, the description. It will tell me yes or no. So now I select the columns that I need, the business name, inspection score, violation description, and then filter. So I only want the restaurants that have one of these violations. Right? So that's what we do. And then just to inspect the data to make sure that it works, the way we think it works, and you can see these are the restaurants that got one of these high serious violations on the right hand side here. I don't know why they got a score of 91, but. Uh, <laughs> That's a good question. Now, this begs the question we got to dig deeper in terms of why did they have such a high score with such a serious violation, right? So that's the next step. Well, not for us, but yeah. Oh, this line? Right here? Yeah. 
yeah, that's a UDF that we define right up here. Easy to define function. Got it? Yeah, uh, up here we created that UDF and then now we're using it right here. Okay, so we calculate which restaurants have serious violations. Now let's do the what proportion. So compute number of business in each post of school. By the way, does anyone know 914 3 is? Well, I don't either, but here's the here's Google map that can help us. <laughs> That's general area. Okay. It's the restaurant. Yeah, exactly. So now we have both of these data sets now. How many, zip, how many restaurants per zip code and how many restaurants per zip code that have the serious violation. Now we can divide them to find the ratio, right? So, so we will join them. And let's, let's do some kind of statistic, statistics to see kind of, any kind of correlations between these two data sets in, in terms of if a, if a zip code has high number of restaurants, do they tend to have high number of restaurants with violations or not? And that's what correlation is. A uh, statistic function. So that's what it's saying. This is very highly correlated. Kind of makes sense. So here's the final result of taking, figuring out what is the proportion of each the restaurant in each zip code that have one of those serious violations. As you can see, the, I guess, what do you call that color? It's the one, the restaurant, number of restaurants representing that have one of those serious violations. So 94133, that's this one. And 94109, which is this one. So it's kind of makes sense. There's a lot of restaurants in this area, right? So there you go. So that means the violation is six percent below the minimum. Right. Which is kind of small. So in general, are San Francisco restaurant clean? No? <laughs> we don't have actual data to back up. Uh, what do you guys think? So that, that's all I have uh, for you guys is we write on time. I guess we have a few minutes for second. I mean, questions. If there's any questions. Yes. Yes. Oh, if you want to run locally on your laptop? Yeah. Yes. I mean, your notebook is more than enough. But it all depends on how much data you're processing. It's one single instance. Uh, I have to go back and look at their uh, cluster here. If you do, yeah, you can you can have a subscription with Spark that you pay, so you can request how many nodes, and it will launch that on a fly for you. Well, with, with Databricks, there's two kinds of costs. One is the subscription to use the Databrick platform. And the cost, the additional cost of the how much resources you're using in the cloud. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's right. Yeah, I, in, in my analysis, I didn't really uh, consider the address in terms of at a street level. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that will be something you can take down on the next level. Yeah, I can make that available. But you need Databricks in order to... 
Right. You, you can, can import it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Thank you.